Now, two years ago, for a conference in Geneva, I wrote a paper called On Mythical Certitude, and I revised it for publication in French. And last summer, uh, Ed Casey uh, sat with me, giving it a very careful going over, and I began a revision for this conference. On January 12th, which is a month ago, I fell ill while working on that revision, and then on January 26th, still ill, I recognized the paper wasn't worth what I was trying to do to it. It was not good because it neither had importance in whitehead sense, have a care, here is something that matters. Nor did it seize the opportunity of speaking with colleagues whose concern is metaphysics. So I put that paper aside in favor of bringing to voice matters I feel more urgent and more directly related to you. Now this act of not following through with a declared intention, that is breaking the contract implied by a title, is unusual enough in my habits and serious enough in possible disappointment of the audience that this act needs some defense. But how? On what principles did I decide this change of course? Moral? Aesthetic? Do they differ? What determines the proper subject of a public talk? Mere feelings and moods? What is the relation of the paper to the audience, the mind to the world? The questions raised by the failure to follow through with the plan have become central to my theme tonight. First principles metaphysics, cosmology. In my work so far, I have not directly engaged metaphysics. If anything, depth psychology of soul making, as I've been formulating it, is a via negativa. No ontology, no metaphysics, no cosmology. A knight errant, always off at a tilt, iconoclastic. The insistence has been on the veil of soul-making, staying in the valley of the shadow, turning even at times against my own tradition, Jung, for his ascensionist prospects, his pronouncements from the mountaintops about the meaning of life, the generalized theories of typology, the self, mandalas, synchronicity. I have tried to follow Jung, the psychologist of soul, and not the metaphysician of the spirit. And for all its puer impetus and anima aroma, my work has been stringently dedicated to lowland tactics, to the discipline of image, of phenomena, of pathologizings in the mode of critical skepticism. Something further is needed, and I've known this for some time. In October 1979, the French National Radio invited to Cordoba in Spain, in Andalusia, a group of thinking men and women. And we were some 30 people from physics, from neurophysiology and experimental psychology of mental imagery, Jungian thought, and let us call them metaphysicians of the Eranos, Eranos circle, or Neoplatonists maybe, Gilbert Durand, Toshihiko Izutsu, Kathleen Rain, David Miller. And we sat for five days at a raised green horseshoe table in a great hall in the palace where Queen Isabella gave Columbus the charge to go out to discover America. And during those days, the spirit of Henry Corbin was very much present. Why, I wondered. Jung's eminence was less significant. Jung seemed to have been absorbed by the prevalent worldview through his concern with science, the paradoxes of rational thought, union of opposites, matter and spirit conundrums, synchronicity, the psychoid. Corbin, however, stood apart from the age or reflected it from another place as a metaphysician who wanted to briser l'histoire, break through history into theophany, the revelation of the gods. 
and thereby a restoration of the world to the temple of the imaginal. Corbin's was not a movement from the material world in which we are, eastward to the Orient for reorientation, or upward to a spirit that is nonetheless based in brain or biology or the physicist's matter, like Prebrum or Capra. Corbin starts where Neoplatonism must start, in the blue, in the imaginal, or mundus imaginalis, viewing the dismay of the world from there, not physics first, metaphysics. When in Cordoba, the physicist and metaphysician David Bohm admitted frankly and sadly that physics had released the world into its perishing and that physicists had neither learning nor ability to think the world out of its peril, and that this job was not the job of the physicist anyway, we saw that our plight was way beyond the discipline and the men who had advanced this plight. I saw the terrible need for metaphysics. The end of the world, the physical threat, results from a metaphysical catastrophe. I understood then why Corbin, during the final days of the meetings in Spain, had become so prominent. And I understood what was expected from Jung. It is to him as metaphysician that so many turn. And I'm I am indeed a deviant from this main line of interest in Jung because I have been avoiding, even working to annul his metaphysics so as not to lose his psychology. But now I realized that psychologizing was not enough. The critical tradition of seeing through, of perspectivalism, of metaphorical ambiguity, of relativism and desubstantiation, my via negativa in the veil of soul-making is necessary, but not sufficient. It is sufficient neither internally nor externally. The internal needs of the soul require that its psychology meet the soul's concern about the nature of the cosmos in which it finds itself. The smallest child, the smallest Freudian child, asks Aristotelian questions about coming to be and passing away. Soul seeks to understand itself beyond itself. It attempts in a strangely persistent and universal way always to fantasy beyond itself. Otherwise, would we have the many sciences and philosophies, the theories of origins and ends? This paranoid restlessness of the soul to be metaphysically satisfied by ultimates of meaning must be acknowledged as one of its internal needs. Externally, the soul is situated differently than in any time since the flood. Extinction is more than possible. We are at the edge of the final solution. Sure, the Turks were once at the gates and the Black Plague, but there could always be imagined a remnant or another place to go, and at least the buildings, the trees, would go on. The bell tolls now for the whole earth and its catalogue of all and everything. If the anima mundi, the soul of the world, is in this unprecedented situation, then psychology must also speak to and from the soul in this situation. So it struck me in Cordoba that what I had been doing was merely another strand of Western skepticism and nihilism. Worse, by declining to engage in metaphysics, I was even abetting the decline of the civilization into the catastrophe of concretized nihilism. My via negativa, though different in content, 
because of its call of soul making, the vivification of imagination, the restoration of the gods, still retained as method the critical, skeptical analysis such as we find in bare existentialism, linguistic philosophy, operationalism, and deconstruction theory. Was I really so different from those I opposed? One thing we held in common, the failure to grapple constructively, positively, with metaphysics. So I could no longer blame our plight on natural science, on old Descartes and Hume, even on Christianity's apocalyptic and world-disdaining theology, Mary over Martha, the unconcerned lilies of the field, the earth's garden as a place of agony. The blame was mine, too, even if I seemed to have escaped into soul country, issuing ennobling calls for enlistment in the ranks of soul makers, because patriotism, even of soul country, is still the last refuge of a scoundrel. But how face metaphysics with a friendly countenance? And how change a whole style toward construction, development, positings? And how do all this without taking back what is clearly the case? Metaphysics has for the main failed the psyche. And how change a whole style toward construction? How do all this without taking back what is clearly the case? Metaphysics has for the main, as I said, failed the psyche. Collingwood, in his Metaphysics, entitles a chapter, Psychology as Anti-Metaphysics. But this has to be, as has had to be, because metaphysics usually allows a soul a place no bigger than a pineal gland and reduces soul to subjectivism and feelings, to an epiphenomenon of material nature, or accords it value mainly by positing a home for it in an afterworld. What soul does make fantasy images has moreover been condemned by metaphysics as untrue, unreal, and amoral. So there's a long history of warfare between metaphysics and psychology. Could one stay in soul, is my, was my question, is my question, and yet serious, take seriously the soul's need to go beyond itself. You see, I had been literalizing the need to stick with soul by staying stuck in soul. Or, in other words, how fulfill Jung's suggestive phrase, essay in anima, that is, to be in soul or being in soul. With a, how fulfill that phrase with a psychological metaphysics? Well, in the years since 1979, I've been setting down jottings in a folder labeled cosmology. And that word will occupy us in a moment. Because these jottings are sketchy and schematic, is it legitimate to say I have been engaged in metaphysics? Because when we think of metaphysics, you know, we, we, what comes to mind are the great synthesizers, like Aristotle, or St. Thomas Aquinas' huge edifice, Leibniz, Hegel, Uspensky, Teilhard de Chardin, reaching from paleontology to the spheres and aeons, the all-encompassing vision in synthetic construction. But maybe these can be distinguished. The metaphysical vision and the metaphysical synthesis. Coleridge, for instance, succeeded at the vision, but failed to hold it in coherence. Locke certainly was coherent, and the anti-metaphysical metaphysics that he published certainly gave the mind foundations for politics, psychology, scientific reason, and philosophy. But was it a metaphysical vision nor is coherence itself the key criterion. 
A metaphysics doesn't have to unfold deductively a la Spinoza, but can be eclectic, that is, selective, pragmatic, heuristic, perhaps even the work of a bricoleur. Whitehead has been accused by Pepper of just this eclecticism. So the fusion of logic with metaphysics is a bias we don't need to share. The metaphysical basis of our Western mind, after all, is as much in the sayings of Jesus and the fragments of Heraclitus as in the antinomies of Kant and the logic of Mill. So you see there's a distinction. This helped me, this encouraged me, this distinction between metaphysical vision and metaphysical synthesis. For my access to mind is sporadic, fragmentary, polemic, and certainly not all-encompassing. Mars guides me more than Saturn, and Hermes more than Athena. And I feel claustrophobic when submitting to generalizations and laws, and I call out paranoid when required to enter any system. The distinction encouraged me furthermore to note more carefully the style which mind takes in psychological hands. Here I found a third way of doing metaphysics, besides vision, besides synthesis, which is metaphysical praxis. And I think this is the psychological mode. Now, theories of depth psychology, you see, the metapsychology, as they call it, has been born side by side with practice. A psychological metaphysics will continue to be tied to its twin, practical therapia. We are less metaphysicians in a visionary sense or synthetic sense than we are practicing metaphysicians in therapy. We dare not think a thought without noticing its effects on the twin of practice. When I go towards transcendence in thought, does the twin brother blanch and push away his food? Does he sail off sunward? Or does he squat in the dust and snarl? Thought may not be rationally consistent with behavior, but still the fantasies in thought and the images shown by behaviors reveal common themes. What you think in metaphysics and the way you practice are very close. For instance, Western synthetic metaphysics, with its inherently world-denying, abstractive tendencies, has been the thought of men, from Plotinus, through all the Catholic schoolmen, through Descartes, Berkeley, Berkeley, Hume, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, to Wittgenstein, and Santayana, men who never married, who spawned no families. And I left out Kant and others. I think Hegel married. Pardon? And, and Whitehead. <laughs> Just here, my critique of Jungian metaphysics has taken its aim. The paranoid effects in practice of the metaphysical system of the self. And just here, the critiques of Hillman have been leveled. The inflating puer effects in practice of the metaphysics of archetypal epistrophe, leading all things to the gods, therewith forgetting that the literal is necessary for pathologizing. My point here is that metaphysics goes on in practice. And we need to see how the psychological praxis of metaphysics actually goes on. The particular virtue of the psychological mind is its twisting of the given. Seeing through, hearing echo and implication, turning back or upside down. The psychological mind makes the given imagistic, 
fantastic. Hence its affinity with both the pathological and the poetic. And hence also its distance from the programmatics of action and the formulations of the sciences. Our difference with the sciences is not that we're more faithfully phenomenological and do not abstract into more inclusive generalizations. Depth psychology abstracts all the time. The difference lies rather in the practical effect of abstraction. Scientific abstractions seek to posit what is really there in the given, substitutive for it and constitutive of it. Our abstractions seek to drop the bottom out of the given. That's why we so need the word unconscious. The trouble is that the metaphysics going on in our practice is not just methodologically negative, it is substantially negative. The method drops the bottom out of any positive statement. Our practice turns on its own metaphysics with its own deconstructionist tropic shifting. Our method is a Euroboros, eating itself up with its own mouth, the talking cure of its own talk. And yet the bottomlessness into which we empty the given is in itself not negative. As Freud said, in the unconscious there is no negation. Our entire practice is filled with importance, transitions of emotion, Again, my reference to Whitehead. Our entire practice is filled with telos, aim, Whitehead's word, including the deconstructive act of seeing through. Now, if you ask what gives importance, what is the purpose? For the sake of what do you see through that act of psychologizing, always seeing through what somebody says, what the dream presents, what's going on here, that constant act of seeing through, which is the psychological mind twisting what is there into its image, its fantasy, trying to see further, deeper in. For what purpose do you do that? What gives it importance? The reply can't be positively asserted. Any positive answer will itself be subject to seeing through. The moment you say the reason why, then you see through that. What's the fantasy going on in that answer? To twisting the answer into another fantasy. Now this is not a logical dilemma like the old conundrums left over from Zeno. It is not a dilemma at all, but a yoga, a via negativa, not Zeno, Zen. An emptying out to go beyond the sheerly given opening to the beyond of metaphysical speculation implication. We practice an alchemical metaphysics, that famous slogan, account for the unknown in terms of the more unknown. That's why we need the term unconscious. That's how we account account for conscious events in terms of the more unknown, the unconscious. Notice here that this further unknown beyond is a more. At the same time, emptying is going on, so is filling. Or in that language we talked about, Ed, uh, the same moment that absence is going on, so is presence. In the act of deconstruction, there is a constructive aim. Now, what can we say about this filling? What are the constructs of this beyond? Beyond the verbs that carry us across to doubt, to ask, to repeat, to twist, to echo, are there any nouns and adjectives on the farther shore? Well, the jottings in my folder cosmology may be relevant. I beg you to remember these are merely jottings. The word cosmology refers both to the astronomical order of the heavenly bodies, and it also 
has a metaphysical meaning according to Whitehead's Process and Reality, whose sub subtitle is An Essay in Cosmology, a scheme of general ideas in which every element of our experience can be interpreted. Two meanings. Cosmology as the heavenly bodies, cosmology as a metaphysics by means of which every element of experience can be interpreted. Now, why not keep together the two meanings? astronomical and metaphysical. Let's say that the astronomical bodies, the planets, offer metaphysical bodies, the gods, by means of whom every element of experience can be interpreted. What is beyond in both meanings are the heavenly bodies. Here are some nouns and adjectives some processes and realities. The planetary persons fill the void of the beyond with the myths of their bodies and the bodies of their myths. And this cosmology is a psychological field because they're planetary persons with traits, characteristics, and relations with one another. What goes on beyond can be known through mythical fictions. The beyond, quite literally, a mythical region. Myth offers the only metaphysics I can imagine for psychology because it is personified and always presents itself as fiction. It negates its reality even as it presents it. Myth has the happy effect of forcing the mind to be psychological. And as long as myths are alive, or were alive in our culture, we didn't need depth psychology. Psychology as a word appeared as myth died out. And cultures that don't have, myth, uh, don't have psychology have mythology. Because myth declares itself to be the supreme reality that is at the same time the supreme fiction twisted, empty and full at the same time, and you have to see through. The poetic basis of mind, myth, imagined also to be the poetic basis of the universe. But are these stories, these fictions, true? So it says in my folder, asks my jottings. Dumb question because the answer has to be referred to the field itself, the many persons of the planets. Truth in terms of which planetary god? Which, which god's notion of truth? Who says it's true? Moreover, we have to inquire into truth psychologically, truth as psychologically satisfying. Now, one characteristic of psychological truth we've already noted. It follows the way of the psychological mind, that twisting which allows the soul to make its fantasy images. So psychological truth is a twisted truth, in the Renaissance called twofold truth. And psychological beauty is twisted beauty where, as Plotinus and the art of memory recognize, the ugly has more immediate and a memorable effect on the soul than does the harmonious. And Whitehead, too, sees discord as essential to beauty. And psychological goodness, just to finish with the three of them, the jottings say, is twisted by the shadow that falls in every intention, every action, every result, every judgment. This recognition of twistedness is what I call psychological. Now, just here I can imagine someone arguing, you can't start with the twisted. It requires something straight, literal, defined, for it to be later twisted. The twisted can't be the first step. Let's assert before we deform, or let's posit and then negate 
like Hegel. The twisted can't be the a priori. Now this argument views the twisted only from the straight, from oppositional thinking. Actually, twistedness comes in many sizes and shapes, curves, braids, folds, labyrinths, mazes, kinks, knots, webs, waves, polyphonies. And when one views all these marvels of the twisted, the straight suddenly seems a rather narrow and naive line to hold to. I use these examples about truth and twistedness to show how difficult it is to set up a psychological metaphysics because of the ingrained prejudices against its methods, its habitual axioms, its language. And we'll have to come back to language. Anyway, a psychological cosmology will inevitably twist cosmology itself. Reading the ancient cosmologies, not merely as straight historical predecessors, but also for their psychological fantasies. For instance, each of the pre-Socratic four elements of which the world is constituted would become an elemental pathé. Pathé, root of the word pathos, pathology, pathologizing, uh, being affected, suffering, being moved. Four ways that imagination affects the soul, such as described by Gaston Bachelard. And Bachelard himself would be an Aristotle for us, giving psychology or giving our metaphysics or giving the concrete sensuous imagination its elemental categories. Another ancient cosmology, one of the most important ones in our whole tradition, the geometric shapes of the elements in Plato's Timaeus could be read to mean not that the ground of experience is mathematical, or follows deductively logical laws, which is the way it's always being taken, but that the ground of experience is shaped. The pathé, the sufferings of the elements, the elemental pathologizing that is the ground of the psyche, has definite limits. The soul does have its limits contra Heraclitus, the limiting shapes of its images the indefinite, the infinite, the chaos, can therefore be taken not literally so, but themselves become imaginative shapes. Metaphysics, for all our attempt at a via negativa, it seems, cannot be other than positively formed. It seems impossible to assert an absence of form. Even the titans are titans. The formal cause again achieves priority. Moreover, and still in the Timaeus, Plato's great cosmology, after earth and water and air and fire, there's a fifth geometric shape, which Plato says the demiurgos, or God, used for the shape of the whole. It is a dodecahedron, that is a twelve-sided figure which Plato says has a pattern of animal figures thereon. Now what in the world is this? Here is the whole, the ultimate fifth quintessentia, the overall and everything, and it has a pattern of animal figures thereon. <laughs> a very physical sort of metaphysics here. Of course, this 12-sided figure could refer to astronomical metaphysics, the cosmology of the zodiac, the animal figures of the 12 regions of the heavens. Even so, it could also be imagining the world soul, the anima mundi, as a configuration of animals. Now remember Plato's Republic 9, where he presents the symbolic image of the soul. There's a dialogue going on, yes, no, oh yes, Socrates, so on. And then he says, from, takes from myths an image of the soul, called a symbolic image of the soul, 
as a manifold and many-headed beast with a ring of heads tame and wild. Now here is a cosmology which configurates the farthest, most comprehensive beyond in animal patterns, animal faces, the soul a multifaceted beast, anima mundi as animal mundi. Here in this twist of Plato, we are close to the ancient Egyptian idea of animals as themselves gods, and to the idea shared by circumpolar people and still alive in shamanism that the animals are divinities from whom, in direct relation, religion arises in human minds. So maybe I'm even delivering upon my original title on mythical certitude, a psychology of animal faith, for we are returning to the earlier question about metaphysics. How envision an animated cosmology, a metaphysics that sustains a living world in face of its extinction. Now my jottings jumped to Whitehead. The movements of these animal figures affect the soul as transitions of emotion, Whitehead's language. And these transitions of emotion take rise in the many-headed beast, tame and wild. By means of emotions, we know where, when, and how the animal patterns reveal themselves as feelings of importance or interest in Whitehead's terms, showing us that nature is alive, as Whitehead says, and preventing the universe from abstracting itself into mere matters of fact. Moreover, the soul itself is a society of animals, says Whitehead in an amazing passage. Each animal body is a living society. This personal society composed of a cage act of changing the title of my paper tonight. What gives importance to this paper and not to the other one? And I've answered that by deriving importance from the animal shape of the soul. I'm suggesting, too, that emotions are, as William Blake said, divine influxes, not sheerly subjective moods. If respected in this way and cared for as divinities, as living animals, tame and wild, they can maintain the cosmos as living. Recollection of and care for the animals is the metaphysical praxis that goes hand in hand with the cosmology. <clears throat> One more cosmology twisted in my notes. This one is the sun-centered universe of Copernicus. I think it is true that he never looked through a telescope and re-imaged the entire system of our world in his imagination. The sun of which they spoke, Copernicus, Brahe, and Kepler, refers to a planet in the Mundus Imaginalis. They centered the universe upon an imagination of the sun, which was at that time, and archetypally at all times, the yellow lion of the heart. Copernicus, Brahe, and Kepler said the earth turns around this heart. We circulate in the streaming light of the universal bloodstream. The source of vitality in the universe radiates not just from solar conflagration, but from a roaring animal. According to Paracelsus, the imagination in the human heart is directly connected with the active imagination in, of the universe located in the heart, in its heart, the sun. So there's a direct microcosm, macrocosm relation between the heart and the sun, which endlessly emanates its energy as images, forming life with its imagining power. Now the Newtonian mind of which you spoke 
abstracted the rays of the lion into heat, light, energy, velocity, solar rays, the photosynthesis of chlorophyll, but the twisted metaphysics of soul sees chlorophyll and the calor inclusis of all living things to be images fulminating from the sulfuric green lion, shaping biological life into its magnanimous variety of forms. In other words, the Copernican revolution places an animal imagination of the heart in the center of the universe. Well, there are consequences of this cosmology that we cannot expand upon tonight. We do have worlds enough, but not the time. Were we at Eranos, for instance, and I was granted a whole long second hour now to envision further, we would be looking at theory of knowledge and perception, theory of aesthetics and value, theory of anthropology and psychology. Some of this I already have begun in talks at Eranos. Now briefly, these talks assume that all things, all things are inherently intelligible. I have to explain this a little bit, or at least twist it a little bit. This intelligibility does not depend upon adducing universal physical laws or upon a coherent systematic theology. It is an intelligibility given with the shape or physiognomy of the world which is afforded directly to our sensate imaginations, to us as animals. Whitehead writes, as animals we find ourselves accepting a world of substantial objects directly presented for our experience. Therefore, cosmology in the metaphysical sense, as the interpretation of all elements of experience, is made possible not by the systems of thought, but by the intelligible nature of things themselves. The cosmos has a logos, or is a cosmology, because it is backed by the intelligence of the planetary persons who display themselves in the world. Well, then why don't we see them? Why is the intelligibility of the world not more apparent to us? Why do we feel lost behind a dark glass, disoriented? Is it because the gods have withdrawn, as Rilke says? Or is it because we have fallen in sin away from them, as Christian theology asserts? No, not Luke, Locke. Our theory of perception simply does not let us see them. Now, I don't mean see them in an epiphanic, Pentecostal, deathbed vision in white light. I mean rather our Lockean theory of perception denies qualities to things, removing intelligibility from their faces. They stand there dumb and dead without heat, without taste, smell, color, touch, sans everything. The physiognomy of the world has been defaced and removed all to the mind, thereby severing life from appearance and appearance from truth and from reality. The world had first to be abstracted in order for it to conform with the abstract account of it. Or maybe we should say the loss of soul in this metaphysical position made it impossible to perceive any other way. You see, a living sense of the world requires a corresponding living organ of soul by means of which a living world can be perceived. Well, Whitehead has already demolished this kind of thinking epitomized by Locke, that removes the emotional face of things. And I wish Whitehead were still around, in a more practical sense, 
to take down structuralism and deconstruction, which follows it, since they continue this indifference to the actual occasions of the phenomenal world. This image here that is immediately presented and not some other, reducing what is there to abstract structural relations or troping it transformatively into something else. Anything can be anything. Polysemus has come to mean polyethylene, polyurethane, utter plasticity. Proteus become a monster. The changeability of form become a mockery of form. All relations, a web of endless, intricate relations, and no spider. Maybe the ruling Western cosmology that cannot see the gods in the face of things begins even before Locke, back to monotheism. Should, that should have been back to Methuselah. Uh, to the god who never showed his face except to Moses, who then replaced the divine face with divine law, with abstract commandment, ethics for aesthetics. But there is another way of reading that monotheism. Henry Corbin reads the Quranic passage, everything shall perish except his, God's face. Corbin reads that passage, everything shall perish except his face, to mean everything except the face of that thing. Seeing the face of the gods in things means noticing qualities as primary and speaking in a richly qualified language. Adjectives before nouns. In the Renaissance, in alchemy, the art of memory, in astrology, thick, and I don't need to go into astrology, I'm in California, thick crusted things, things gray and dull, Wintry or living in isolated places belonged to Saturn, as did laconic speech, a mathematical turn of the mind, measuring tools, and so on. All things, styles of mind, diseases, foods, geographies, animals, find location according to their qualities. Everything has shelter and altar. Nothing is lost. Everything belongs in the cosmos because it belongs somewhere as image to the planetary persons and their myths. This emphasis on descriptive qualities gives back to cosmology its original aesthetic meaning. We've lost that first sense of the word. Cosmos now means empty, vast, spacey a video game for astronomers. The Greek word meant orderly, becomingly, duly, an aesthetic arrangement. Cosmos once referred to the anima mundi, the world soul. It was an aphroditic order. And our word cosmetics, referring to the facial appearance of things, brings out this original sense. I'm hurrying now, time's winged chariot, but you can find some of this spelled out in the spring 1982 article which uh, was distributed for these meetings. The point here is, this cosmology requires an aesthetic notion of human being. Jung's essay in anima, that is being in soul, is a psychology and an anthropology. Essay anonyma, being in soul, comes to mean not homo faber or homo rationalis, but homo aestheticus, to coin a term, the human as a sense-perceiving, image-making creature. We are sensate creatures, animals in an ecological field that affords imagistic intelligibility. Whitehead might call this nature alive. 
the cosmos displaying its self-enjoyment. The revolutionary theory of perception developed by J.J. Gibson and his Cornell School of Direct Realism advances in cogent argument and experimental analysis this aesthetic animal view of perception. Now, one further step. Homo aestheticus is also Homo cordis or cordialis, man of the heart, heart man. The psychology entailed by this anthropology shifts the seat of consciousness from head to heart as the organ of the sensus communis and of the perception of images. Cosmology cannot become really psychological, that is, given as aesthetic images to the sensate imagination and twisted by that imagination, unless the heart awakens as an imagining, sensing organ, no longer merely the organ of subjective feelings. Then importance can refer to images moving in the world soul, and not only to my own private piece of these motions. The practice of psychology, or psychotherapy, has this intention, awakening or circumcising the heart. Therewith, the Aristotelian idea of the sensus communis, located around the heart, expands into three concurrent meanings that express the aims of therapy. The common sense as the interpenetration of all sensation and imagination. Every image sensate, every sensation imaged. These are, these are the ideas of the sense, the common sense, as the aims of psychotherapy. The second is the common sense as ordinary plain man reactions to the face of the world. And common sense as communal sense, what Alfred Adler said was the final aim of therapy, Gemeinschaftsgefühl, the development of the common sense. When theory of perception changes, then so does theory of knowledge. Knowledge of the world and of experience of every sort would now mean knowledge of their relations to the gods. Knowing would mean leading things out, exegesis, leading their intelligibility to their sacred home. Each thing an E.T. calling home. Epistrophe. Knowledge becomes gnosis as things and experiences, by their being known, make present their heavenly bodies in the anima mundi. Rather than abstracting us from the world, knowing takes us more directly into its soul as aesthetic presentation. The way to see the faces of the gods is to know the world. Thus, practical knowledge, common sense, Lebensphilosophie, cannot be divided from metaphysical knowledge. Knowing serves the soul's life among sense images dissolving that problem with which we started, metaphysics as anti-psychological. Now, lest you think this path of knowledge is utterly imminent, horizontal, only in the world can the gods be known, let me refer again to Henry Corbin. The circumcision of the heart so that it can perceive subspecie marginalis, or that is, can perceive things as images, is an instruction by the authority neither of philosophical learning nor empirical testing, those two traditions, philosophical learning or empirical testing. No, neither book nor Bacon. Instead, initiation by the angels and daimones, the persons of the imaginal world who awaken the active imagination and teach the reality of their images 
apart from the mind that believes it imagines them. We learn their truth as witnesses and bring recitations, Corbin's word, true accounts of what has been seen and heard. After descents and flights out of the world, oneself the subject of an exegesis, being led out by an angel, the psychopompos, then the world becomes transparent and the beyond here. And seeing through becomes not an effort of analysis, subjective strain, you know, have to see through this complex, but appears with vision itself. Encounters with the psychopompos are the way of knowledge. An active imagination is the essential metaphysical discipline necessitated by this cosmology. Say it again. Encounters with the psychopompos, the guide of souls, the imaginary figure, are the way of knowing. An active imagination is the essential metaphysical discipline necessitated by this cosmology. This discipline is now rightly called psychotherapy. Well, in this luxuriously long second hour, I would have been allowed to tell about the kind of language required by a psychological cosmology. Its main quality, generosity. The generous language of imagination. The language of thought does not have to be strict. It has to be fecund, to use the term of Suzanne Langer, Whitehead's pupil. Fecundity must mean more, however, than merely her sense of interesting. Interesting, too, needs to be led out from subjectivity and located in the gods. Interesting suggests a Neoplatonic vision of the gods as fertile, seminal. We've said animal. And what makes the fiction of the gods interesting and thus fecund is that they provide self-generative amplitudes ever-flowing fountains of fantasy in the Neoplatonic vision. And cosmological language responds to them in kind. And Jung's method of amplification, though diverted by a scientific pretension, is at heart an act of ritual, responding to the amplitude of fantasy images with a correspondingly full language. Well, since cosmology satisfies the metaphysical need for a vision of invisible primary assumptions and is formed in language, cosmology, as I said, cannot help but be mythical. Its language must recognize this mythicality, regardless of the very demythologizing purpose of its metaphysical intention. Thus, the language of cosmology cannot submit to metaphysical analysis, since that critique, too, imports myth in the very words it uses. The critique of a vision itself implies a vision. Metaphysics' own primary assumptions are cosmological. The words of a cosmology are the cosmological edifice and must serve it in every part. Because cosmologies are built in language and not merely of language, the house of the soul will be itself ensouled, an ark for the covenant. A psychological cosmology needs generous language because, as Whitehead says, the notion of life implies a certain absoluteness of self-enjoyment the notion of life implies a certain a notion or implies a certain absoluteness of self enjoyment well why not let this self enjoyment this physical celebration of what is enter into our metaphysical interpretation of what is why cut the enjoyment out when interpreting life 
The planetary gods, the elements, the animals, these provide a cosmology in the noble high style, which is what generous first means. Things that trace the origin of their quality to the gods are indeed high-born, as the word means in the dictionary. So the account of them will exhibit the pathology of the high-blown. Besides, generous speech itself generates, opens out of itself. It performs a metaphysical practice by breaking out of operational definitions, giving generously by implication, pointing to the beyond in words which go beyond themselves, twisting themselves into releasing soul as the language moves along, so that animation is going on in the construction itself. Think of the difference between Russell and Whitehead, between Skinner at Harvard and Santayana and James at Harvard, between Aristotle's clarification of the soul and Plato's generation of soul through his dramatic, his generosity, his dramatic and twisting dialectic, the personifications, etymologies, ironies, scenes, and myths. Words are themselves little mythical beings popping up as jottings, fictions, generating fictions, trailing their genealogies as, as etymology, making music and echo and phonetics, dancing their syntax, perishing and coming to be, more and more of them crowding forward over the exhausted heaps of wingless cliches, asking to come in. Words are angels, Hosanna. Now, if a metaphysics is built to meet a paranoid need of the soul for overall meanings, I have at least not been paranoid this evening. If anything, confused, hysterical, the sentiment d'incomplétude, trying to get it all in without covering myself with well-prepared positions. Hence your feeling may be that what I have been saying is all wet. But the soul's need for a cosmological vision does not have to be met literally in its own terms with a paranoid system. To explain this would want more time, a third hour beyond even Eronos. Time, time belongs to any cosmology, and because I have left it out, willfully, it returns as the repressed and brings these jottings to a ruthless, or perhaps to you who have been so patient, a merciful end. Thank you.